Um, okay. Uh, I've written briefly myself about one of the incidents um, that Derek Gregory is working on uh, in a paper that's in the online journal Mediatropes, and I won't go into that in detail. It involves the killing of civilians um, in Urzgan province in Afghanistan in February of 2010, and it was documented quite well um, in this article um, by the journalist David Cloud um, in the LA Times. Um, and to make a long story short, um, it, was a, it was a case where simultaneously a, a, a special operations force had been, um, was, was located uh, in this rather remote region of Afghanistan, uh, following up on reports of Taliban activity in the area. And coincidentally, a group of Afghan villagers set out in a three-vehicle convoy, heading off to do various things, go shopping, basically go down these very, very remote, rugged roads uh, in, in, a, in convoy style so that if one of their vehicles broke down, you know, they could help each other out and so forth. So we have this, this, this simultaneous, very, very early morning um, special forces operation going on in one place and in the near vicinity this this convoy um, and so the drone the predators the predator surveillance pilots in coordination with some um, attack helicopters began monitoring this convoy and over the course of several hours convinced themselves that this convoy was in fact Taliban and that they were heading in the direction of the special forces. And they convinced themselves of this to the point that they attacked the convoy and they killed somewhere between 15 and 25 people who turned out to be civilians, women, children, etc. So this was a big enough incident that it had to have, there, there was a thorough investigation identification of targets. Um, so here's a quote from uh, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, John Brennan. He says, with the unprecedented ability of remotely piloted aircraft to precisely target a military objective while minimizing collateral damage, one could argue that never before has there been a weapon that allows us to distinguish more effectively between an Al-Qaeda terrorist and innocent civilians. Now you can see the two things that are being conflated there. What the weapon does is once a target has been designated, the weapon will very accurately hit that target. But of course, the weapons aren't actually involved in identification at all, although there were there moves to automate identification, which is something we should be even more worried about. But it's a conflation of the precision of the actual strike and the you know, growing evidence that we have for the imprecision of the practices of identification that are informing um, these operations. And here's, um, I think, a very powerful visual graphic uh, from a group um, called Pitch Interactive, um, called Out of Sight, Out of Mind, and I'll just you know briefly sort of read it for you. Um, so, so what we have above the line are uh, the frequency. Uh, so this is from 2004 to 2013. These are all of the um, airstrike strikes by the U.S. and Allied um, uh, operations uh, between those years. Um, and so we have above the line the, the frequency, and you can see that in 2008, which is the year that Obama was elected, there's this enormous increase in drone strikes. And then below the line, we have documented casualties from those strikes, people killed. Um, we have a tiny little band of white here, uh, which is the 1.6% of 50 people, and you can kind of see those little bits of white um, here, those were the people who were actually identified as people who were um, who who were believed who were known and had by, been identified as as posing imminent threat um, to the United States. So those are you know the bad guys, the people who who have been actually identified as having ill intent. Um, then there is this kind of literally and figuratively very large gray area. This is like 76 percent of the casualties. Um, we don't have any idea actually who these people are. So these are unidentified as, you know, there's no, there's no unambiguous um, actual identification of them. Then in the small dark red band, there's 16.7%, 553 people who were actually identified as being civilians. So we, we know they were not militants, combatants. Um, and then finally, the bright red at the end were children who are <coughs> taken to be. Um, uh, innocent. Um, so in other words, um, 
we, you know, this is, I think, an incredibly, you know, literally graphic depiction of the extraordinary imprecision of, of the actual um, identification, again, behind these ops, op operations. Um, and so, again, um, let me return briefly um, to uh, this question of the kind of um, orientation to us and them that informs these visualities. So as, as Gregory says, high resolution imagery is not a uniquely technical capacity, but part of a technocultural system that renders our space familiar, even in their space, which remains obdurately other. So he's arguing that the kind of modes of situational awareness, the visualities that get carried, uh, that get, get re continually regenerated through these systems um, are systematically oriented to uh, reconstituting this difference between us and them, um, where that's often read as the good, the good guys and the bad guys. And just to point briefly to a really extraordinary piece by Jennifer Terry um, in the online journal Vectors um, called Killer Entertainments, she's looking at um, increasingly mil the military uh, uh, ground troops actually wear head-mounted cameras, and there's starting to be some really interesting scholarship on the images, the, the media that are produced through these head-mounted cameras. And so Jennifer Terry has collected together a bunch of these and then done these very interesting annotations of them. And they really convey this kind of, again, it's not just the drone predator operators in Nevada, it's actually the troops on the ground who are also moving around with an incredibly sort of particular um, scopic field or, or, or field of, of visuality. Okay, so then I want to end by making a bit of a leap, um, but it's, a, it's very much tied to this question of how we read, um, it, to questions of identification, not identification not only in the sense of like how we figure out who's who, but also in that sense of kind of affiliation. Um, how, who do we recognize as being, you know, human? Um, and what is the basis for that kind of recognition? Um, so again, going back to Gregory as a way into this, um, he has a post uh, where he looks at the work of the forensic architecture group at Goldsmiths and a particular project that they did um, on forensic oceanography. So this was in support of NGOs who are working for international accountability for the deaths of migrants from Northern Africa and the Middle East who are attempting to reach Europe by sea. So they're, they're, these are deaths in the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, so, so this is my last case of, of forced mobility. Um, and it opens up this, another aspect, I think, of questions of, of identification with, with others at a distance. And I want to just briefly um, uh, show you, as we end, um, a, a short video, um, and do we have time? How, what's our, yeah, yeah okay, good, it's about seven minutes long, so. Uh, and this video I learned about from Carolina Follis at, at Lancaster, who's in politics, and as I mentioned, she works on, on borders, and she's very interested in what happens in, in the sea and kind of international waters, where it's a bit ambiguous, who's responsible. Um, so this is a, uh, it's a documentary that was made by, um, by some uh, documentary journalists from The Guardian, um, but it has a very particular characteristic. Um, so I'm gonna play it for you and then I'd like to talk about it briefly and, and close. Oops, you have mysterious. الإنسان جوات يقارب بالسوق بأعدو عود ولا بضربو كذا بريك الليبي إنه خلاص نحن رح نموت هلا بعد شوي أكيد رح نموت فكل العالم صارت عم تقرأ قرآن عم تقول أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله والقرآن وبالصوت العالي. This is a story about five friends: Maaz, Majd, Rasha, Kinan, and Khalid, who fled war-torn Syria to embark on a perilous trip to reach Europe. Already this year, an estimated 3,000 migrants have died attempting this same journey. I had my family to go to the house, 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 to go to the house,
واخذ ارقام مهربين صار حاكي لنا حكي بيطمن لا تخافوا ومركب مأمن فانه في اف بي نصحك انه لا لا تطلع عن هذا الطريق الطريق كثير خطر انه انت بنت يعني انه ليش شو عم تعملي بحالك انه ليش عم تروحي هالروحه طلع انه انا فيي اوصل سو انا ليش حتى ما اوصل On the 16th of August 2014, they set off from Syria to Lebanon, where they caught a flight to Algeria to begin the first leg of their journey. Once they arrived in Algeria, smugglers put them on coaches and they headed through the desert for the Libyan border. After a 22-hour coach journey, not knowing where they were, their smugglers sold them on to another group. بس خلص يعني كله طلعوا كذابين. وقت بيصير جوات القارب 